We have a very interesting subject this morning, and one about which there is very little common agreement on teachings and beliefs. The most exhaustive and contemplative approach to the mystery of love was that of the Neoplatonists of Alexandria. From Neoplatonism, which in turn was a descent from the Platonic philosophy of Plato, from this system has emerged a mysticism that has been distributed throughout the entire world. Alexandria, which was the seat of Neoplatonism in North Africa, was one of the great centers along the caravan routes. And merchants, travelers, priests, monks traveled along these roads for centuries, resulting in an interchange of ideas as well as commodities. In the course of time, <coughs> the Neoplatonists developed what might be termed a philosophy relating to the mystery of love. They realized, as time went on, that there had to be a deep and mysterious source for the idealism of the human race. There is something within each person that reaches out for affection and to bestow it. This uh, power resides not in the mind, nor in the body, but in what we have tentatively termed the soul. The soul is therefore the source of the good within ourselves, and it is also part of the uh, wonder that we have received <clears throat> from our divine inheritance. The uh, power to love, the need to be loved, have descended from the most remote times. There is no period in which this system of interchange has not been noted and recorded. So the question arises, first of all, what is love? And this is the big question. Love seemingly is not part of any of the academic elements of the personality. Love is part of the principle which produces life. Life in itself is a manifestation of love. And love, therefore, is that which perpetuates, which binds together, which ennobles and deifies all of the other conducts of the human being. Love becomes, so to say, uh, the leader of the purposes of life. And in our present time, we are in the presence of a great need for this, because it is only when motions towards culture, civilizations, education, politics, economics, and industry are seated in a love principle, until that time, we are going to have continual struggle, strife, and conflict in the world. Love is the basis of an integrity. Love is something that ennobles conduct. It lifts our deeds, thoughts, and emotions from the commonplace and gives them a damsel within our own over-lives, what Emerson calls the over-soul. Therefore, where there is love, there will not be deceit. Where there is deceit, whatever emotions exist that we call love are not genuine. All of the nobler instincts of the individual impel him to integrity. And integrity is the basis of honorable relationships between all living things. Where integrity fails, all else is at hazard. Integrity, therefore, is something that is sort of tied in with the Ten Commandments. It is part of the Sermon on the Mount. It is found in the dialogues of Plato and in the mystic writings of Buddha. Lao Tzu, the great Chinese sage, was a mystic, and all mystics are involved in the love mystery. Love mysteries which transcend all denominations, sectarianisms, and things of this nature. As Paul says, love suffereth long and is kind. Well, I think if we look around us today, we'll find that people who suffer long are not kind, and that instead of the individual 
placing his integrities in the foreground. He short changes his entire life by discarding them. And where he is unhappy, he makes the world understand it by making them unhappy also. Wars, problems, crime, deceits, exploitation are all part of an underworld against which antiquity established a code of moral integrities. These integrities were for two reasons. First, because the creating power demanded them. And second, because mutual existence required them. So the ancient most primary form of love is listed in Neoplatonism is love of God. Now this is itself a very intangible thing because we know very little about what God is. So that the effort to love deity, while it is found in, in all the religious writings of the world, is very difficult to interpret. We know also that many different nations have had various attitudes towards deity. Some have used the principle of God to justify war and plunder. Others have used it for exploitation. Others have used it as the basis of the building of theological empires of wealth and power. Actually, however, the love of God was, according to the ancients, the primary basis of our relationship with the universe. Whether we consider deity as a person, a principle, or an idea, that which holds the universe together is this basic concept of essential goodness at the source of existence. Lord Bacon says that he would rather accept all the fables of the Koran than to assume that the universal fabric was without a mind. So there is an over-mind, an over-spirit, an over-soul, an over-consciousness, an over-reality, which more or less seems to be necessary to explain the common things of existence. Without an understanding of some superior principle, the inferior objects of our attention are comparatively meaningless. Now, the ancients in the beginnings began to worship God in terms of what they believed deity expected of them. Deity expected them to live in harmony with the Sermon on the Mount, with the Ten Commandments, or their equivalents. In other words, worship was keeping faith with reality. The worshiper had to practice what he believed, or it was not worship. Prayer was originally a hymn of glory or praise to the unknown for the privilege of existing in a universe of values that helped all of us to improve and give us securities. So the, in, in the beginning, the idea was to worship God by keeping his commandments. If you love God, keep his commandments. Now, the loving of God became one thing, and the keeping of the commandments became something else. The love of God seemed fine as long as it dealt with intangibles. But when it got down into the marketplace, it was very difficult to keep the commandments. Each individual with his own private ambitions, his own private exploiting instincts, decided to build the world closer to his heart's desire which largely resulted in exploitation. But the principle behind the beginning of love was that the human being, created out of the divine reality, whatever it may be, pays homage to its own source, is grateful for the privilege of an existence, is ever mindful of the wonders of life around him, and as he contemplated the mysteries of the world, the sciences, the arts, all of the different divisions of human handicraft, it became increasingly evident to the average person that there was a sovereignty somewhere greater than himself, and that this sovereignty was his protector, and that without it his own efforts, trials, and obligations were meaningless. So gradually deity became the principle of an ideal, an idealism which has survived through all different religions under various names. So the Neoplatonists said love of God comes first. Love and respect, veneration for the total of which we are a part. 
We cannot look out upon the mysteries of the universe, the cosmos, space, time, and eternity, without some realization that we are in the presence of an awesome reality, something tremendous, something incredible, something far beyond our ability to understand, let alone to, di to define or organize in thinking. So the worship became a bowing to that which is better, a, some, a humbling in the presence of true greatness, a power by which the individual realized that he existed, that without this power he could never have been. And then, of course, comes the question as why he came to be. And it became evident to many ancient peoples that his existence was due to the love of God, and that in his turn he protected himself by the loving the God who was his creator. Also we have to realize that the ancients, living largely on the level of the brood family or the tribe, saw in deity the ultimate patriarch, saw in the deity the elder of elders, that which came first, and recognized this patriarch as a benevolent pattern, a benevolent significance not necessarily a person as represented in the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in Rome, but an over-reality. It became obvious that this over-reality had to be intelligent or it couldn't have fashioned the world. It had to have a reason or it would not have done so. It had laws by which it administered its own creations and it was probable and appropriate that man should also abide by these rules. So gradually the parental figure appeared the magnificent over-being in which we all live and move and have our being and for which uh, we must have a proper attitude. Somewhere in the early times also, the individual found that there could be certain inconsistencies between himself and this divine being. He found that he un uh, and intentionally or unintentionally broke faith with this divine being. And when he did this, something went wrong. He, he found, for example, that when he broke the rules, the rules began to break him. He suddenly discovered that this power, this mighty power that ruled all things, was also an absolute authority, that it had within itself the eternal possibility of, an, of a rewarding virtue and bringing vice around ultimately to redemption. So in the beginning, at least, moral codes arose, such as the Code of Hammurabi and uh, the Justinian Code later. These codes were efforts by the, by the part of human beings to codify uh, the experiences of God's will. Uh, these codes all were based upon experience. They proved conclusively that evil got into trouble that injustice was punished, that false beliefs died and many, many people died with them. Everywhere, evil was in some way penalized. Selfishness was penalized. Or, uh, arrogance, the enslavement of human beings, this was penalized. Anything that was not beautiful and not good could not be according to the will of God. So in the, over a period of thousands of years, a kind of deification came into existence. I think it was Voltaire who pointed out that the first and most important concept of God was that he was a highly glorified Louis the Fifteenth. Well, he could have been to a certain degree, but he certainly didn't have the faults and failings we attribute to Louis. Actually, however, man trying to find an image for this power had nothing to copy except the realities of his own environment. So as he had his own chief, his own prince, his own ruler, he thereby believed that the ultimate prince and ruler was this power of eternal realities. And all in all, he gradually and definitely came to the conclusion that he had to bestow upon this power all virtues. For if he did not do this, if he did not presume this power to be just, reasonable, affectionate, understanding, then all of his own personal relationships with life were threatened. If this deity could become angry, then there was a reason why man could be angry. If this being or deity became very vengeful, 
then there was reason for man to become revengeful. This was gradually written into theology until a great number of destructive attitudes were sanctioned because they were attributed to the will of deity. Of course, the deity had nothing to say about this, but the human being got himself into all kinds of troubles by believing that his deity had the same weaknesses that he suffered from himself. So all in all, we came finally to, this, to the conclusion in the world in general that this deity was good that this deity was concerned, involved, and many different philosophies were developed to explain these involvements. Whether the uh, deity was indwelling in the human being, whether there was a separate existence in space, or whether space was simply the body of this deity. Whether deity ruled from above or from within. And the mystics all fi finally came to the conclusion that God ruled from within and that no one could look out far enough into space to find this deity. It might be there, but we could never find him. But the deity within ourselves is approachable, and as it approaches us, it gives us the codes of law. It sets upon us rules. It strengthens us with conscience. It does all kinds of things to try to make us live right. Sometimes we resent it. Very often we deny it. But if we expect to survive, we must obey it. So this became the basis, more or less, of our entire attitude of the love toward the love of God. God was the infinite goodness, worthy of our veneration, our respect, our adulation, and our acceptance. So the ancients, including the early Semitic tribes, Christianity, the Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, and all these different peoples, all agreed that the greatest of all virtue was to, uh, to love God as the source of truth, as the source of reality, and as the hope of glory. So this foundation has come down to us. It has survived in many mystical institutions and has been perpetuated by generations of mystics in all parts of the world. So the first thing that we say uh, is uh, and the kinds of love is the love of God. Now the second kind of love begun to be some of the end of God is part of the first. After, actually all forms of love arise from the original first love, the relationship between man and the infinite. All other relationships are secondary, but in their secondary relationships there is a concatenation. Some are more immediate, some are more important than others in the general pattern of things, but all are subject to the same overrules. The Neoplatonists, Platonists, and many others decided that the second proper point where a man could direct his attentions and affections would be in his love of wisdom. Now, wisdom was something uh, that uh, was considered in two different ways. There was a wisdom within God which God alone knew. But there was a search for wisdom among human beings desperately striving to find out what God wanted, to find some way of proving their religion by glorifying their Creator. Wisdom, therefore, became the search for the proof of the reality for, of God. Love of wisdom meant simply that the individual I believed that there was a great spiritual value in a form of knowledge or wisdom by means of which he could come closer to the discovery of the infinite. Wisdom was very different from learning. The older peoples thought of wisdom largely in terms of the elders, the patriarchs. The wise were those who had lived long. The wise were those who had traveled in far places. The wise were those in whose hearts and minds the love of humanity and the love of God were identical. So the search for wisdom led to the building of schools of philosophy and theology, both more or less interrelated in the beginning, by means of which it would be possible for the individual, through the love of wisdom, to acquire wisdom, and by acquiring wisdom, become closer to the deity which he could not directly and immediately approach. So wisdom, the love of wisdom, was a great virtue to the ancients. 
Now, wisdom had all, had all certain limitations upon it. All wisdom to be wise had to include the primary concept of the divine power. Wisdom was not an effort to build a tower of Babel in the abyss, nor was wisdom to create a glorified uh, humanity in which certain savants or teachers or sophists, as they were called, had great credit and recognition, were respected and admired for their wisdom. All of this was trivia. Uh, when Plato thought the matter over, he realized here clearly that the uh, course of wisdom was not to glorify the wise, but to share in their knowledge to glorify that which was worthy of glorification. Wisdom was therefore the problem of building a solid foundation under an ideal. If honesty was right, there must be proof of it. If idealism had values that could be perpetuated and communicated generation after generation, they had to be sought for, and every truth that was discovered supported the eternal truth of deity. So wisdom had to be idealistic. Wisdom had to have as its primary purpose the justification of the divine plan. Now, of course, today we have many scoffers who do not believe there is any divine plan. But it is not obvious or not recorded that this attitude constituted essential wisdom. And the Neoplatonists, especially Plotinus and Amplicus, were devoted to the concept that wisdom resulted in the development of an apperceptive mysticism. The truly wise person had the inner experience of the fulfillment of the wisdom that he sought. In the quietude of his own inner life, he had the experience of divinity. For a moment he found himself picked up into the Empyrean and had the emotional, mystical, psychical experience of being in the presence of the deity. This deity he did not see physically. He did not see it even emotionally or mentally. But at more than seeing it, he was it. He became part in it. He was actually absorbed in a state of consciousness infinitely superior to his normal condition. Under those conditions, the mystics found the consolation of wisdom. They found uh, the fact that no one is wise, really, but the Father, who is also the fountain of all wisdom. And because it flows from his own nature, it is a virtue. And because it flows from his own nature, it bestows upon mankind the privilege and power to know more about him and all the things that are accomplished in his name. So the love of wisdom was considered to be superior to the love of any physical ambition. The love of wisdom was much more marvelous than the love of wealth. It was much more powerful uh, than the love of uh, war or statesmanship or sciences. A man might be a great physician and as such would be quite acceptable. But to be a great physician, physician, he must be wise. Because without wisdom, sciences are dead. Without wisdom and vision, arts are useless. And they are all reduced to a strange mediocrity, such as we are seeing today in a great many areas of life. So the second great love was the love of wisdom a love which caused the individual to sacrifice other considerations for the sake of becoming wise, with the realization also that with wisdom inside of himself, he justified the divine purpose and gained a greater ability to cooper cooperate consciously with the plan of which he was a part. So wisdom helped man to serve God as a useful and helpful servant. And uh, this was the blessing of deity, that he blessed those who sought first wisdom, because if he sought wisdom and righteousness, all other things would be added unto him. So wisdom became a power, a power fulfilling in itself the love of truth, the love of reality, the desire to understand truth. But wisdom involved a kind of contemplative uh, acceptance of something superior. Wisdom required the contemplative realization of a life superior to our own. 
It ensouled the universe, which was no longer merely a body of atoms or beings or particles, but was a great living thing in itself. And the universe, as a great, as a great living thing, was also a great loving thing because it was sustained after it was created by the eternal love of deity. So all these things God worked their way into the Neoplatonic philosophy and gave us a certain understanding of the way of life. Now the third uh, love is a little harder to us to appreciate because of conditions of our time, but it is essentially as sound as any of the others. And that was love of country love of patriotic relationships with the earth, with the land, with, the, with our neighbors, the pride of country, based upon the fact that all work together to preserve the honor of country. But to love country meant to be honest. It meant to keep the rules. It meant to help the widows and the fatherless. It helped to protect the natural resources. It made every man his, his own leader in reformation and the brother of all others. It was the conservation of other forms of life everywhere, the, the country, the nation, the basis of the racial demarcations. These were units like cities or towns, each one of which was a responsibility to its citizens. Therefore, love of God meant honest citizenship. It had to mean that man worshipped the truth he could not see by working with the truth that he could see, and that he had to maintain as far as he could the dignity of the community in order that if the Lord asked for that dignity, it was available. Any time the individual is false to his community, he is false to his world, and when this falsehood gets bad enough, we have war, rebellion, and sedition. So that the love of country meant that each person in it would be an honorable citizen by decision of his own will and would work with all other citizens to make sure that the land in which he lived was at peace, had all the proper rules and regulations of a well-ordered structure. That wherever the parts of a country are neglected, or the levels of society are arbitrarily divided. In a community of the rich and the poor, uh, there cannot be a full acceptance of the divine purpose. Each, each individual must try in every way that he can uh, to help those in his own world who are in need of help. It is one thing to bring gifts to the altar of God. Uh, but it is also important to bring food to the mouths of the hungry. Both are acts of worship, and both are evidences of love. So love of country meant to keep, take care of it, keep it clean. Uh, it, meant, it meant that the citizens should have a recognition that in their religious life they, gave, they give thanks that they have been born in a land which they could make beautiful by their own dedications. And if this land is not made beautiful, if it's bordered in strife and all the discomforts of competition, then they have broken the truth of God. God demands intelligence and integrity. Where this is the absence, absent, all other forms of worship are relatively imperfect. To pray and at the, to God and then cheat your neighbor is a very great and dangerous sacrilege where people do not even pay any attention to it anymore. It is now open season on anything you can get your hands on. The individual has, feel, has no feeling that uh, uh, his religious life is directly in, in, in ratio to his relationship with those around him. He, he does not want to cheat the friend but he, won't, he will cheat the enemy or the stranger. But in the universe of God, there is no stranger and no essential enemy. Everything has to be solved by the keeping of the rules, as these rules were delivered in flame and fire from the crest of Sinai. They are the rules of human relationship. Wherever they are broken, man suffers. Therefore, the problem of patriotism rests upon 
the individual accepting as a responsibility the duty to take care of the land which belongs to his particular tribe and be respectful and considerate of the land belonging to all other tribes. No competition is permitted. Each fulfills his destiny by perfecting that which is within his own domain. So love of family, love of uh, patriotism or love of the clan was actually part of religion because it meant that every day the individual had to watch his own conduct in order to make sure that he did not deceive or defraud. Now this problem comes from that rather close to us right now with all the uncertainties and the skullduggery that is going on in the world. We suddenly realize that in one way or another we have become not only atheistic, we have but become actually criminal in our relationships with life. And this cannot be excused or condoned because the individual by birth is not this way. He has to be conditioned by an environment composed of other malefactors. Now in all the other type times we have another point that comes in. And that is what uh, the ancients called the worship of light. Now light was a very wonderful and strange thing. It was almost as impossible to understand, for them at least, uh, as the mystery of God himself. But of course with our astronomy and so forth we now have discovered the sources of night and day, eclipses and the like. But light itself is something else, as Newton realized. Light is a symbol. It is a symbol of universal insight and understanding. If light is one thing more than another, it is education. It is an education founded in truth. In the ancient times, education was not in the keeping of institutions as we know them now, but was in the hands of private tutors or in the, in the keeping of the religious institutions. The individual's education uh, was more idealistic than now, even though it might be considered less academic. I think up to a very recent times that the Japanese, as I've mentioned before, had a very good point on this because I went through the curriculum of the grammar school or middle schools, high school and the universities to see how they laid out their education. The grammar school had reading, writing and arithmetic, but on the books it was written ethics, reading, writing and arithmetic. High school, ethics, geometry and so forth. The university, ethics, industry of art, science, medicine, ethics, anatomy and physiology. Everything that was taught had as a basis ethics. So this was the supreme importance. Without ethics, education produced delinquency. Without ethics, it produced persons incapable of perpetuating the better part of the world in which they live. Therefore, the ancients and most of the more recent wiser people have considered uh, the light pr principle as worthy of love. We love truth. We love light. We love understanding and insight. It is by light that the flowers bloom and the meadows are green. It is by light the children's eyes brighten in the presence of understanding and insight. It is by light that ignorance is dispelled. But light is essential learning, worthy of our love, worthy of our respect, and maintained in the spirit and principle of the eternal power that is at the source of all things. Therefore, light is in reality a symbol of the protection of truth as it develops and unfolds in the world. It is that something that suddenly make, it gives meaning to all the other situations of life. When, some, when the ideas we learn light up inside of ourselves, then we have a kind of illumination. It may not be a great spiritual revelation, but when light hits knowledge, it lightens it. It makes it available. It gives reason for it and gives the person who receives it a new respect for the things he is learning. 
He is discovering as the ancients learned long ago that all the things he is learning are part of the mystery of the reality in which he exists. And he must, in, in all instances, put his roots down in that reality. If he has that reality, he can learn anything with safety. Without that reality, even the multiplication table can prove fatal. Now, after this particular point, we come to the next one, love. And this is love of beauty. The ancients were very firm in their belief that beauty was a mysterious and intangible thing, that beauty became a moral issue. Beauty was morality, and uh, that which is lacking in beauty is usually asymmetrical. Everything that is not true, everything that is not worthy, everything that outrages the laws of harmony, rhythm, color, all of the arts, that which desecrates the art is a form of atheism. It is something in which the individual tries to put some small individuality of his own before the laws governing art and beauty. The laws of music, the laws of painting, the laws of theater and of the dance, the laws, all the laws of the performing arts are all under very strict discipline. There's not only the discipline of the performing, there is the dif discipline of the selection of subject matter. The uh, artist may be good, but if his subjects are poor, he, he has compromised his skills. If he uses his skill to compete with others in the striving to create a wealth or fortune or fa reputation for himself, then he is wrong. Love of beauty has nothing to do with profit. Love of beauty has something to do with fulfillment. It is the individual becoming more aware of the realities. And in this, I think the Oriental arts are especially uh, fortunate. The average Oriental artist not, does not even bother to sign his name. And up to very recent times, great art was never signed. Also, the artist, uh, well, well, a potter, a very famous Japanese potter, uh, was once asked why he didn't sign his work. He said he didn't sign his work because if they didn't know it was his by the work itself, he had failed, so he didn't want it signed. Actually, the meditative process of the Zen masters, in which all art began with the tremendous discipline in the internal regulation of conduct, and in meditation, the artist sat by the side of the road or in the, by the side of a little pond somewhere and looked and watched. And uh, as they tell you of Seshu and several of the other great artists of Japan, he may sit there with a brush and a piece of paper, they didn't choose silk or canvas, and a piece of paper and look at what he was dreaming about for six months without putting a line on the paper. Then in five minutes, with five strokes, he created a masterpiece. It had to go through his own consciousness. <coughs> It had to be given a quickening in himself. He had to have the experience within himself of meaning, of reality, of significance, and with it also a moment of quiet prayer that the universe would bless the work. No Oriental artist would ever make a great painting without prayer because it has to contain a realization of the divine purpose. And great art in the East is almost always a prayer dedicated to love of reality, to love of something beyond our own common daily experiences. So art becomes another worthy field of endeavor. Love of great art is a symbol of maturity. A love of an understanding of art is an enriching of the whole life. And I think in the West now we particularly need to think about this because we have now a very decided dichotomy here. We have people who love God, but they have never owned a piece of art that's worth anything. 
they hardly ever maybe go to a, a, a gallery to see anything. They do not realize the importance of expression. They do not realize that art is something that helps them to fulfill themselves. The individual who meditates hour after hour but never creates anything himself is missing the point. So art is a way of expressing your love for realities, love of beauty, and the wonderful possibility of delineating in one way or another through your own insight the proportions, dimensions, and relationships of living things. So art is a form of worship. The love art is to be a mature person. To love good art is to be a more mature person. And to recognize the art of the great artist, the very universe itself, in its sublimity, is to really understand the place of beauty and worship it and venerate it and see it in, in the, as part of the love of life. So the love of beauty helps to mature us, helps to make us better people, helps also to give us outlets of various kinds for the creative instincts locked within ourselves. Thus we have the actual development of these forms of uh, creative expression. The next uh, form of love that the ancients venerated and considered to be very, very important was the love of skills. Uh, there was something to be said for a person who had a great skill. I've told you before the story of the man who asked Antonio Stradivarius why he made violins. And the Italian master said, I make violins because God made Antonio to make violins. <laughs> now, if we had more people who build automobiles from the same motive, <laughs> if we had a few motion picture producers that worked from that foundation, if our television programs were dedicated to something of this nature, uh, we might have a very much easier life. And what more than that, we would have a rapid lowering of the crime rate. We haven't realized at all that our mistakes are problem are problem in our lives. We do not understand these things. We keep on doing what we please, except our accepting whatever comes along and expecting that the infinite will ignore our mistakes. But not believing in the infinite makes that a little easier. But the mistakes still have a harvest of grief. So skills of all kinds problems of dedication. Here we have this great story of the Dionysian artificers that went into also into Alexandria to help to build the great city of Alexander the Great, which Alexander, by the way, never saw. In the, these grites, the grites of architecture, these clans of builders were dedicated to religion. When they decided to build a great building, they first gathered to worship. Wherever they moved to become cathedral builders and set up villages for their workmen, the first building was the church. Also, these people had, the architects, had no narrow bigotries. When someone wanted to build a church like Notre Dame or Chartres, artists would call from all over the world. They may be Mo might be Mohammedans, they might be uh, Chinese, Japanese, Greek, whatever it was. A little later, they might be either Protestant or Catholic. But whatever it was, when their villages, when they went to build those buildings, there was no creedal division. Also, they set up their own way of rulership. They had their own holy trinity, the three masters of the work. They had their own servants and workmen, all of whom were on an equal social level. They, it took three or four hundred years to build some of these churches. So generation after generation of the same family lived in these artificial towns until the work was done. If someone would sick or died, the group took care of the widow and the fatherless, the foundations, but they've drifted a little off center. Actually, therefore, all the skills were worshipped. Every temple and church was a spiritual revelation the different flutes and columns of Greek temples were designed to meet the requirements 
of the deities represented. No building was simply built from a general plan. Every building had to be a complete expression of the purpose for which it was intended. It had to be a morality in stone, a revelation in marble, and a vast structure to the glory of God. So the result is the buildings were a little better done, I think, than they are now. At least there was a great pride and dedication. These builders were worshiping God, loving God, by the skills of their hands. The Essenes of the Holy Land, of to which order it is sometimes believed that Jesus belonged. The Essenes were a group of mystics, and they worshiped God by service. When they uh, wanted to pray, they may have had a few words of prayer, and then they went out and built young people a home so they could start out in life and didn't charge them anything for it. To build houses for young people starting out was their way of expressing their love of God. Now, it may see a little complicated, but this type of affection for things has a great deal of integrity in it, a great deal of meaning, a great deal of value. So everything was just as practical as you would want it today. Everything was just as efficient, but it was ensouled. There was something behind it that you didn't have to make rules and didn't have to go through all the lockers every day to find if someone had some cocaine in there. These rules, first of all, dedicated the workmen to their work. It made their work a glory. No one worked just for money nor work for fame, but to express his own inner convictions. Every conscientious builder was building for the greater glory of God and the greater good of mankind. This type of thinking was the under part, and this is where it seems to me that the love factor is tremendously important, because we have so little evidence of it in any of the vast institutions that we are building today. We are building with credits, we are building with bond issues, we are paying fabulous sums for efficient management, much of which lands in jail in the end. We do all kinds of things. We do things that are destructive simply because they are profitable. We endanger the civilization to which we belong for a few dishonest dollars, and never the thought comes to mind about it at all. And in such cases as this, the love factor which is supposed to warm up and make things beautiful, is completely uh, overlooked. We continue to insist that love is a very personal emotion and that this love emotion is very physical and uh, maybe a little bit uh, parental, but for the most part indulgent. And there is no moral responsibility, no sacredness in the affections which we try to practice or maintain which brings us to the seventh of the divisions, and that is love of family. This is the final uh, chain, a link in the chain that binds the world to the pinnacles of Olympus. Family to the ancients and to the, most people was a microcosm. That is, it was the little universe. It was the little world over which uh, a little group of people alchemists, so to speak, were attempting to perfect the chemistry of human relationship. Home was the beginning and first great challenge of a cooperative society, and home became very important way, way back in China, when there were records of the keeping of the various family records and so forth for nearly 2,000 years before the beginning of the Christian era. The whole Chinese system of family was very simple. Family was a little diagram, just a little thing you could put on paper, a symbol. But it was the perfect symbol of the largest nation that exists, the largest continent that exists, and the whole planet. Because all the values in life that are important are based upon the integrities of human relationships. And these integrities, integrities include friendships and family memberships. The individual who cheats his friend is a little more guilty than the individual who cheats his enemy, but both are equally wrong. 
the, the Chinese were quite convinced that there should never be in this world a family to which God could not come in for dinner if he happened to be going by. He was the unseen guest was reality, integrity, and value. And these people tried in their best way to prove this, especially through the teachings of Confucius and Mencius. They taught very, very simply, but very directly, the importance of the family relationships. One thing they pointed out, too, which was very important, and that is that each individual in a family has certain inalienable rights, just as every tree in the valley has inalienable rights. The family is a, a, a group of people uniting by mutual agreement, living together because they want to be living together. But each one has the dignity of a person. Each one has the right to be treated as a person and to treat all others as a person. But according to Confucius, there was never a time in which a discord between parent and child was right. There was never a time when the courtesies that are in public should not be practiced in private. If the uh, gentleman opens the chair or moves the chair so the lady can sit down in the restaurant, he should do the same thing at home. If he wears a little better clothes when he comes to dinner, he should do the same thing at home. If he is kind and gentle to other people, if he allows his friends to go through the door before him, the same should be done in his home. His home should be as courteous, kindly, cooperative, and understanding with proper respect for the rights, integrities, and convictions of every member. Now, it would sound as though this might end in chaos, but it would end in chaos except for one thing. If all do it, it is a perfect cosmos. It is everything living itself in harmony with all other life. And then the uh, entire problem of Chinese culture, this is very strongly emphasized, that after all, regardless of race, nation, or any other factor, humanity is a family. It is one family that has been artificially divided by false instruction, has been isolated by localities, has been tyrannized by tyrants and dictators, has fallen under the abuses of slavery and every other type of evil. But in the universe of things, love of God means to straighten this out. We cannot love God as long as we neglect the inalienable rights of our neighbors. We cannot build a good world while we try with sword and bomb uh, to dominate the, the patterns, beliefs, and convictions of our neighbors. If tyranny ends in one area, it will end all over. Because tyranny can only feed on tyranny. Tolerance gradually takes over, but only if tolerance is established according to the will of God. Also we find in this family problem a great deal of lack of insights. People do not know how to raise a family. They do not know what to, com to compromise and what not to compromise. They are constantly thinking of their own place in the family, when the answer really is that they must find the, the family place in their own hearts. Until they do this, there is no solution. Now, all these were therefore called phases of love, phases of love that extend all the way from the dramatization of the divine plan to a little romance on the back porch. It is all part of the same thing. But love, primarily, is a universal energy, and it cannot be blocked into small patterns. There cannot be any fulfillment in love if it is dominated entirely by physical considerations. Love is not basically physical, but the physical world is a place where love can reveal itself in a magnificent way self-sacrifice, dedication to duty, life and love that go beyond the grave. All of these things are dedications and proofs, but they are meaningless unless the individuals involved have these convictions within themselves. 
So we can say, perhaps, so for, in generally speaking, that all we really need now is a universe ruled by love. What we don't realize is that's what we've got, but we have perverted it. We have denied it. We have built another world on illusions that have no substance in, eth in ethics or integrities. And yet there isn't a single blade of grass that grows or a single tree on a hillside that cannot help us to find the truth if we want it. The trouble is most people in all of their activities are not concerned so much with truth as they are with profit. They are constantly considering the advancement of their own causes. Therefore, we have the curious phenomena of selfish love. Well, selfish love has something about it that's very reminding of hate, because selfish love ends in hate. It ends in the perversion and destruction of everything that is useful, valuable, or necessary in life. Now, we're all trying to do something a little better with ourselves these days, and we talk a great deal of mysticism. There are many interesting and some very valuable writings appearing on this subject. And there is a very, very important group of books going back to Neoplatonism and the Pythagorean school. All of these things are pointing out the importance of the individual uh, unfolding the resources of himself. The individual to become part of a program or a plan bigger than his ordinary dedications. Therefore, they have this problem of love coming into it. We find that most meditational exercises have very little value unless the individual is sincere. Now, sincerity is not just simply a belief that they will work. Sincerity is also the motive for which it is undertaken. The individual whose primary interest is to try and find a way to perfect his own nature labors in vain. He must have a dedication. Unless he loves something bigger than himself, his intellectual efforts are more or less frustrated. We have great educational institutions, universities worldwide, that are failing because they're all mind and no heart, because they're perpetuating all kinds of useful information without edifying the believer to the point where he will not pervert knowledge. As long as he is not taught to be honorable, no amount of skill can help him to protect his civilization. Civilization is built upon integrities. It is built upon values. It is built upon respects. It is built upon the basic fact that people like Schweitzer, Albert Schweitzer, gave a lifetime to helping people, and that that lifetime has gone much further in the perfection of his own nature than any system of esoteric disciplines could possibly go. To go out and do it, to prove conclusively love of God by loving a job that helps others is probably one of the best ways we have of perfecting the world and the life to which we are dedicated. Now, young people growing up need to be taught this. They need to be taught it not in a sloppy way, not in a sentimental type of thing. They need to be taught it as a great, strong, powerful fact. We are all greatly addicted to facts. We like to believe that what we believe is solid, firm, and sound. And the result of that is, at the present time, we are believing on the shakiest foundation in history. Nothing that we claim to believe has been properly researched, properly examined, properly thought through. And as a result of that, we are simply under the hypnosis of what we term progress. Now, progress is a fine thing, but progress, again, has to be loved. A love of progress is in most people. They, can, they just glorify the idea that next year the cars will be a little better. Uh, that the television programs will be worth watching. This is a hope which may or may not be fulfilled. But people believe in progress. They worship it. They can think of nothing but a new wheel on the computer. They know now that we live in the best world that has ever been because we are developing nuclear uh, material. We know that we are the very 
uh, acme of perfection when we landed a man on the moon. All of this is a worship of what? A worship of comparative non-essentials. All the time that we have been building this machinery, all the time we've been raising the taxes to pay for it, all the time we have had more expensive governments, more expensive sciences than ever before in history, the individual has not found very much love of progress because love would make him dedicate progress. It would make him realize that progress is nothing unless it goes inside of people and makes them live better, makes them more understanding, and gives them a reason to, to worship the integrities of progress. It's all right to say this machine is remarkable, but the next question is, is it being used with an understanding of the purpose of life? Is the man who's using it enlightened? Or is he merely working for a salary? If everything is for salaries and everything is for mechanics, the world will fall apart. It will fall apart because friendship, faith, integrities, love, fraternal realizations, these are the glue that hold the world together. And unless we do something to do this, we're just going to have one nuclear accident after another because nobody really has their heart in it. They want progress, but they do not realize that progress is an incline upward. And, if, and all progress must ascend. There must be a little less of error, a little more of truth, a little more of courage and strength. Unless these values are preserved, progress is a joke. Because we, we, tomorrow we'll have something else. When Einstein made his theory, every said, well, everyone said he was the world wonder. Since that time, another group of scientists have taken him apart. And this is the thing that happens because of one central point, which incidentally, Einstein is said to have made this statement, that he wished more than anything else in the whole world that he could believe in God. Well, it isn't that hard if you really want to work at it. But it's a fact that the materialistic culture, materialistic values, put all labors on the basis of physical policy. The individual works because he is told that this is the best way to do. What he is doing he never questions, because if he does he loses the job anyway. But the mere fact of the problem is very definite, that all this progress, all this tremendous pressure, which is turning the world into a mass of rascals, has as its ending only chaos because every step of progress has to be ensouled if it is to accomplish anything worth doing. Unless it has value of it is. Unless the individual who is doing it has a motive above his paycheck, we are building a civilization that could sometimes go down along with the old Atlantis and the great Lemurian ages that have gone before. Everything has to have a tie to humanity to love for people, for, for recognition of our responsibilities to help rather than to hinder. Of course, the nature and God have their own way of doing some of these things, and it is noticeable that in recent years particularly, a great many private citizens or small groups suffering from the inclemencies of the modern temperatures have attempted to do something. They have taken up jobs of cleaning out problems. They have taken out jobs of curbing crime and have helping to take care of the impoverished immigrants. They are working on problems. And those are the people who are beginning to show that they are learning and that the lesson that they are learning is part of the great school. For among other points of interest is that the universal life has established a system of education uniquely its own. And this education, again, is a very wonderful thing because it means that no matter how many mistakes we make and how long we make them, ultimately the mistakes will correct themselves. We will be, become too weary with suffering unnecessarily. We will discover that the pro policies that we are forming are short-range, that they're unfair, and that they're unreasonable. 
and little by little common sense is taking over and common sense in a certain measure at least seems to be the power of God working in the human soul common sense is something that tells us what the books don't tell us and they also the common sense also to tells us that there are solutions and the investigation of social conditions in search of a solution is becoming more uh, interesting to many, many people. So, but all around, it all sums up in the one compound of love. Everything should move from this angle, from this point, from this uh, premise, that we are here to get along together in one of the most beautiful regions that we have ever heard of, a nice little neat planet that can take good care of us if we do not exploit it. But if we keep on closing mortgages on the planet, we're going to get in trouble. If we keep on exploiting and never replacing, if we keep on thinking of the planet as a magnificent bowl full of everything we want that will remain full forever like the magic picture of the Greeks, we will someday wake up in terrible problem. Because after all, according to the Neoplatonists, the planet is a person. The planet is a living thing. If it wasn't a living thing, it couldn't support life. And every root that goes down into it is being fed by some kind of a wonderful living reality. And the planet has temperaments. Many planets do. It has temper fits. And it has just cause for them. In fact, there's no reason why it shouldn't be very much offended and very much disgusted with its progeny. Because the world is treating the planet very badly. Now, the, up somewhere in the uh, higher echelons of things, you can't treat planets badly and get away with it any more than you can treat your neighbor. All of these things are part of what Buddha called a great commonwealth, a common source of good for all. And the exploitation of any of these values ultimately will result in trouble. And we are beginning to have these troubles in many different areas. Many of our new discoveries, our greatest advancements and so on, are reacting unfavorably upon ourselves. We are not solving anything. We have no real interest in solving. So it's possibly time for us to go back to what you might term the classical educational theory, namely that uh, young people starting out in life uh, went usually, finally, to the head of the village, the archon, or whoever was the master mayor of the village, and said he would, and would say he wanted to go to school. He wanted to attend one of the better schools. Now, their schools in those days, of course, were not like the public schools of today. The school was usually in the temple. And... Uh, before you could join it, you had to apply, and, and, that, and a, an officer was appointed to check your application. So he would come to the fat town where you were brought up, and he would talk to the people there. Had you ever been in trouble? Had you ever cheated anybody? Had you ever been unkind or cruel? Have you, did you ever neglect a civic duty? Were you in trouble with your parents? Where all these different things were weighed. And unless you had a certain uh, degree of integrity, uh, you were not acceptable. And uh, you could, however, make a valiant effort and apply again later. But the, unless you had a basically good reputation to start with, it was not assumed that it was safe to give you any more. After you had been accepted into this system, and were educated, you went into the temple schools. Now, the temple schools are the places where every art and science we know today had their beginnings. Here was mathematics, uh, here was science, here was medicine, here was law. Here was everything of the great university, but it was under the leadership of the, na of the national religion which in the case of Greeks or Egypt, we own, we had Egypt, we know what they, these religions were. After you had gone to a certain degree in this, you took the oath that uh, you would never use this knowledge to discredit or damage any living thing. 
that you would never, if you took the medical degree and took the Asclepian oath, you would never refuse to serve the patient because he was poor. And that all times, every physician had his daily worship at the altar of the God of healing. When in Rome, they, well, they weren't quite so good over there, but in Rome, when they did secularized medicine and said that the doctor didn't have to be educated in a temple or take an Asclepian oath, within ten years they had to put up laws for medical malpractice. It was the religion that held it straight. Where the individual knew that every other physician knew the oath he had taken, and most of his patients did also. It was less easy uh, to forget the integrities to which he was dedicated. And the same in the temple of law. Every lawyer took his oath before the altar of his God. Integrity had to come first. Now, we've gone a long way since then, and of course, ages have passed, and the, the evidence is beginning to accumulate that unless we get some kind of a love above a pocketbook, we're going to be in trouble. We are going to be in trouble until the soul rules the body. We are going to be in trouble until the life within us dominates the policies of our outer daily existence. As long as we can break the rules of God, we will never be successful in keeping the codes necessary for the preservation of human society. Now, of course, this isn't all bad, because actually, if we don't do it right, and we get into serious trouble, we will learn. But we will learn the hard way. We will learn through privation and loss and pain. We will lose the respect of our own families. We will lose the confidence of the world in which we live. Therefore, it isn't hardly worthwhile for us to take the chance, as we do now face those chances with nuclear fission. The situation in Russia recently is a strong warning that we cannot afford to take the chance of allowing strength to fall into the keeping of those who have not been dedicated to the greater good of all humanity. We have to have dedications, and dedications come from love. We are dedicated to the happiness of those around us because we love them. We are dedicated to our family because we love it. We want to do well for our children because we love them. We want to have a close family life because we all love each other in that little small group. But by the time maturity is reached, this little love nest is often broke asunder, broken, ruined, and wrecked by the gradual e exploitation of society by people who have forgotten the integrities of basic truths. So we have to work every day a little bit on this very serious and very necessary matter. And uh, I think love is very good in this sense that it helps, to, uh, helps us not to be critical of others. Even if they're wrong, we can still love them even though they are wrong. But we do not have to copy their mistake. We can also do what we can to help people in every field. It isn't that we have to just sit back and suffer the aloneness of virtue. We're all involved in things. But one point is very necessary, and they're beginning to discover it, the Chinese have discovered it when they started to reopen the temples of Confucius and Mencius. It is being found throughout the world. And even Napoleon Bonaparte, in his worst moment, said that without religion, no nation could be civilized. So we are now in the face of a need for a great world civilization. And the only power strong enough to make it and sustain it is love. A love that has been in us and with us since the dawn. A love that can keep right on making things better for us. But we have to rise to the realization that emotions like love are not just superficial things. They're not just happiness for this and happiness for that. Behind it all, in the pattern of divine love, as it was known in Egypt and among the Greeks and later among the Asiatic mystics, Love was a responsibility that we love 
truth enough to obey its rules, that we love God enough to love the other creatures he has fashioned, and that we love our neighbor enough not to be influenced by superficial considerations. Neither race, nor color, nor creed should interfere with the universality of man's primary respect for life, and that in serving life itself, we become the faithful stewards in the, in the sanctuaries of truth. The world is finally a temple. We are its priests. And unless we practice its virtues, the temple rapidly descends and to become a fraudulent institution. The, uh, the whole theory is rather is clear and simple, and I think it's rather strong and useful. The theory that love is to help things to grow to make them greater and better for their own good and for the common good. And that when the Lord so loved the world that he gave to it his only begotten Son, it is up to us now to know and realize and understand that that sacrifice was not in vain and that the love of God for man can be equaled though by the love of man for God. And when this balance is reached, our world will be a much happier and more livable place and we'll all have time to be our better selves without persecution, misery, or uh, suffering. So it's always a good thing to remember these levels of love because they do help us to plan our own lives and realize that love is the common denominator of practically everything that is useful in existence. Well, I guess that's it. But I'd like to also wish on this festive occasion Happy Mother's Day because that is really the fountain and source of our hope that this will ultimately prove that we will all be mothers and fathers of each other and will all be parents of a better world than we have ever known. We are very grateful to the mothers who have given us being. And we are very grateful to the wise parents who have given us well-being. And we are very, very grateful to God for having given us mothers, parents, and a beautiful world.